Does anyone else struggle with blank page anxiety? I don't really know if this is a thing. I don't know if it has a title. But you know, like you sit down to write a paper, right? If this is not something you do very much any, anymore, uh, imagine yourself being back in school and, and being assigned an essay that you have to write. And, and you open up that, uh, that word processor page, and, and it's almost like that big white canvas with the, the little blinking cursor. It's like it's taunting you, right? It's like, it's like you don't know what to write. You have all this work to do, but you don't know how to do it. I remember, I vividly remember, uh, I think it was in the sixth grade, it was like my first big real research paper. And I sat there at, at my home PC with my, my stack of all my note cards that I had written out from, you know, Encyclopedia Britannica. All the notes about magnetism was the theme. Uh, it was a riveting paper. I'll share it with you sometime if you'd like. Uh, but. I sat there, and, and all of a sudden, the, the, the gravity of the situation sank in on me. I had to write like three pages, three pages about magnetism and, and, and how was it ever going to happen. I knew that somehow these notes on these note cards needed to be put into to sentences and put into paragraphs and, and put onto the page. But how was it going to happen? I knew what I was supposed to do. I just couldn't bring myself to do it. So instead, I sat there clicking on, uh, back in those days, uh, Microsoft Word used to have Clippy. Anyone remember Clippy? It's a little animated uh, paper clip that would pop up and, and offer you suggestions on what to do. It was really annoying, but if you kept clicking him, he would change his animation over and over and over again. And so I sat there for who knows how long, stalling time, right? Changing his animation because I didn't know what to do. I was paralyzed by the anxiety of what lay ahead of me. As we come to this last section, it's not hard to hear what Jesus' message to his disciples is. It's pretty clear, right? Follow me. Follow me. Come where I have laid in front of you. And, and we get the gist of it, right? If you've been around church, if you've been around Christians, you know the, the general direction of what he means, right? To, to do the things that I have done, to care for the poor, to care for the needy, the oppressed, to conform your thoughts and your behaviors that, that fit the pattern and fit the mold of God's instructions for the world, right? To, to share and to proclaim to the world the love of Jesus. It's not complex. We have an idea of what it is that we're supposed to do. We just can't bring ourselves to do it. In fact, it's not just that we uh, are overwhelmed by the task, but in fact, the task, the proposal itself is a little bit terrifying, right? We want to say to Jesus, uh, Jesus, if you haven't noticed, like you tend to, to wander off in some pretty uh, terrifying conclusions, right? Right, Jesus, aren't you the one who said, pick up your cross and follow after me? Aren't you the one who said, if your right hand causes you to sin, uh, cut it off and throw it away? Aren't you the one who said, love your enemy and do good to those who persecute you? Right? To say, follow me sounds great, but how, how, how can anyone actually do that stuff? Maybe even this week. <clears throat> The enormity, the gravity of, of those commands, the simple commands to follow me has struck you, right? If you are like me, you have received a, a steady diet over the last few pages of, of posts, of articles, of videos that, that all start with a, a phrase that says something like this, to my white friends, to my white friends, right, as, as we as a nation are forced to come to grips once again with, with uh, the racism that runs so deep and has cost the lives of so many people, there is a long list, a long list of what those who, 
uh, have the place of privilege in a society of, of how we can help, of how we can rectify, and specifically how we as Christians are commanded to do so. They're not necessarily that we don't know what to do, but it's how on earth are we supposed to change something so big? How on earth we want to be good, but how can we cross the bridge to do it? Here in this text, it's fascinating that John chooses to close this story with Jesus interacting with Peter. Because we know both from what Jesus' expectations of were Peter prior to his death, and we know from church history <clears throat> that there is perhaps no other figure outside of Jesus himself who had a bigger job to do, to whom the call to come and follow Jesus was, was a more serious, more monumental task. It was his job to preach to Jerusalem on Pentecost Sunday. It was his job to deal with tremendous racial animosity as he sat over the Jerusalem council. It was his job to lead and to collect and to support and to encourage a fledgling group of disciples. And so it is here that John gives us the context. It's here that John opens up the window into what Jesus said to Peter. And I think it's good for our hearts to see because we see that it is not Peter's ingenuity. It is not Peter's strength that allows him to follow Jesus. It's his forgiveness. It is his reconciliation with Jesus that opens the door so that Peter could follow. And I think for us too, the story's the same. It's those of us who know we are forgiven who are able to follow. So I want us to look at, at three different areas here. Uh, the, the first is that the forgiven are willing to take care of others. The second is, is that the, the forgiven are the ones who are willing to lose their lives. And the third is that the, it's the forgiven, it's the forgiven who are willing to come in last place. So first, it's the forgiven that are willing to care for others. What Jesus meant when he told Peter, follow me, is pretty clear because he's already said it three times, right? Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Peter's overwhelming obligation, the, the moment of, of, of panic and anxiety, his, his blank sheet of paper if you will, is that he has been charged, he has been asked as a disciple to care and to nurture and to feed for the needs of all of God's people. But Jesus doesn't just say these words to him, he says it to him in the midst of a story. You see, Jesus opens and he says to Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? And I imagine that in Peter's mind, his, he, he saw the image of the servant girl at the door of the night of Jesus's, uh, of the night of Jesus's arrest. The one who said, aren't you one of his followers? And Peter said, not at all. Never could that be. And again, Jesus comes to Peter and he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And I imagine that, that Peter thought of the group huddled around the fire when they looked up and, and recognized his face and said, you're with Jesus, aren't you? And he said, no, 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 you have the wrong man. Jesus says a third time to Simon, Peter, he says, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter remembers his words as he denounced the high priest servant who asked him if that could be the case. You see, Jesus was asking this question over and over and over again three times because he's giving Peter three times to change his answer. Three times Peter had denied, had rebuked, had, had forsaken Jesus, and three times Jesus offers him again to say, Do you love me? Will you uh, come back to me? 
And the text tells us that Peter is grieved. And of course he's grieved because he's reliving the moments of some of his greatest shame. But mingled with those tears of shame is something else. It's a stunning realization. Jesus, when he says, feed my lambs, he's, he's not just giving him a job to do. He's restoring him back into the community. He's restoring him back into his world. So when Jesus says, feed my lambs, Peter's stunning realization ought to have been, I am forgiven. I am restored. Right? I'm not just uh, allowed to come back on probation. I'm welcomed back and put in charge of the thing that is the most dear, the thing which is most important to Jesus in the world, and that is his children. You see, Jesus' command to feed my lambs was a, a stunning realization that Peter had been reconciled, that he was no longer sit in his shame, that he was no longer bound to be disciplined, but one who was bound to be a part of God's inner circle. And it is his realization of his own forgiveness that made him able to care for others. Why is that? I think there's two really quick implications here that we can see. And, and the first is this, that when you know that you are forgiven, you have a, a new ability. You have a window by which you can see into the lives of others. You see, we spend most of our time in life uh, wandering about largely focused upon ourselves, right? Our, our self-absorption, our, our self-concern over what's happening in the world, but here, when when Peter has been forced to look at the ugliness of himself, all of a sudden he can has a window to see the people around him not as as side actors in his story, but people whose stories are just like his. They're people who desperately need someone to help them. They're not competitors. They're, they're not, uh, not stand-ins or, or backdrops. They are lambs, lambs that are hurting, lambs that need to be cared for, lambs that, that, that are in desperate need of the same kind of love that Peter had received. But his forgiveness didn't just give him a window to see other people, but his forgiveness also gave him a mirror. It gave him a mirror so that he was able to look himself in the face. And he was able to come to terms with the fact that when he forsook Christ, he forsook those who went with Christ as well. And Jesus brings Peter back into the fold. Peter has to acknowledge the hurt he did, not just to Jesus, but to all of the people who followed along with him. And I don't know if you've lived with a lot of shame in your life, but looking yourself in the mirror is one of the very hardest. It's why we so often get defensive. It's why we so often deny and hide our sins, but the freedom to look ourselves in the mirrors comes because of Jesus's forgiveness, his reconciliation. And I think it's the same for us as well. It is the forgiveness of Jesus that allows us to follow him in this grand and extraordinary privilege of caring for other people. But it becomes pretty quickly clear that to care for other people comes at a great cost, an enormous cost, a cost that very few would be ever willing to pay. Because it's not just that the forgiven are willing to care for others, it's the forgiven who are willing to lose their lives. Peter's conversation with Jesus takes a, a pretty quick turn here. Jesus, out in his third time, says, feed my sheep. And then he says this in verse 18, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. 
You see, in the ancient world, uh, while this may be a little less clear to you, and John tries to, to bring it out, draw out this fact for you, when someone says that you will stretch out your hands, the implication was not a subtle one. It was a clear one. It was that your hands were to be outstretched in the act of, of, of crucifixion, that your hands were to be outstretched and pulled to the side as you receive capital punishment by the state of Rome. Jesus, at the very outset of his ministry, tells Peter, not only is it your job to take care of all of my people, all of my lands, but also, by the way, it's going to come to a, 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 a very gruesome, grisly death, right? At the very outset, before you even start going down this road, let me just tell you, this endeavor is going to end with you suffering a, a horrific, painful and premature death. Can you imagine? Can you imagine taking up the, 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 the call to feed Jesus' lambs, knowing that that was the outcome? Can you imagine anyone taking Jesus up on that kind of offer? The reality is, is that you would have to be compelled by an otherworldly force because the cost of caring for the needs of others is high. It's really, really high. Over uh, this week, as those calls to action come to us, uh, those of us who are white in America, right, and, and the calls to care for the needs of of our, our sisters and brothers, our friends that are in communities of, of people of color, um, the, the, there's an enormous, uh, an enormous job that we're being asked to do, but there also is an enormous cost. I want to break down this a little bit just so we can, can kind of come to terms with the kind of seriousness of what we're talking about. Uh, Jamar Tisby uh, maybe has perhaps the best the clearest uh, groupings, right, of the kinds of responses, the kinds of, of calls that I think uh, w we have been called to do to protect our sisters and brothers. And uh, he lays them out in, in many places, but including uh, his very excellent book, The Color of Compromise. And some of you might remember, Jamar came and, and preached for us, uh, I guess it was two years ago now. But he breaks down his, his reactions, his responses, into three general areas. He calls it the, the ARC, A-R-C, of racial justice. He calls it the awareness, relationships, and commitment. And the point I want to make to us today is, is just the kind of cost that such an endeavor will call upon us. All right, awareness. Awareness, as Jamar lays it out, is... Is, is a whole branch of reactions in which folks who, who normally are not really affected by what has transpired to the people of color in our country learn and, and educate, right? They use all sorts of mediums from museums and movies, documentaries, classes, seminars, books, podcasts, music, articles, right? Whatever it is that you, uh, whatever medium of information you want to read, there is excellent material out there to, to help us understand our history as a country, to help us understand where we were. But to engage in any of those, while it seems so easy to turn on a, a documentary on Netflix, it seems so easy to pick up a book or to listen to a podcast, they come at a significant cost. It's to choose discomfort over comfort. All right, as you re uh, hear the telling of the, the, story, the history of our country, right? As you consider the heritage and, and the family and the wealth that you have received, you, you quickly become very conscious of the fact that you have a part in this whole story, that you and your family have a part. You start to feel the discomfort over comfort, right? As you start to see things that you can't unsee. Right? If you watch the video of, of George Floyd, I promise you, you will not unsee that image. And so to walk down this road of caring for our neighbors comes at a cost. So too, in relationships. Jamar says that, 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 that the, 
one of the most significant and impactful, the most important steps towards looking for justice for those who, who have been affected in our country is, is to build deep, significant relationships with folks who are of a different color than you are, right? To, to have folks who have lived in the different cultural scenarios, folks who have been treated and received uh, looks and approaches in very different ways than you have. But there's a problem here. Right, there's a problem in that um, one group did a, a survey, and they found that uh, on average, if a white person had in America had a hundred friends, right, on average they would have one of those one hundred would be a, a black person, one of those people would be uh, Latino or Latina, and one of those one hundred would be someone uh, who's who descends from Asian countries. Right, One out of a hundred friends that you might have, on average, one would be a, a black person. It means it's a lot of work, right? It means it's a lot of work because it's not uh, like, if you're like me, you struggle to have fr make friendships anyway, right? As an adult in, in the midst of life, to build significant, deep friendships with other people is very, very hard. And so to, to specifically invest in a relationship with someone whose, whose cultural experience is very different from your own comes at a great cost. You have to make time. You have to make place, right? You, you can't be in the, the places and the streets, right, uh, where you don't interact with those people, right? Because you won't ever get to know them if you don't spend time with them. To invest in a new relationship for many of us will require that we invest less in other more comfortable relationships, right? To, to be in a relationship with a person who is significantly impacted in these discussions is to put yourself in a position to relive shame, to relive and to re-experience the fact that you are continually finding new ways that you have a sickness, new things to apologize for, new things to worry about. You'll experience life with a different set of emotions. So relationships, even friendships, come at a cost. And then the biggest is commitment. Commitment, and in Jamar's uh, taxonomy here, he's, he's referring to, to all sorts of, of direct uh, attempts to, to right wrongs, right? Whether that's in, in policing or criminal justice reform, whether it's in, in education reform, whether it's in the way that our, uh, our cities plan things, the way we engage and structure our, our politics and our voting districts, right? All of these sorts of things that, that require specific engagement from people, right? From, from folks advocating for and speaking about and coming to terms with the, the impact that Every step we take in any one of those scenarios has the opportunity to help and to bless or to hurt and to hinder those of color who are around us. And so there's an enormous, enormous cost that can come with these. Time, right? The time that you would spend on leisure or profit is lost or reinvested, probably a better way of saying it. To, to, to reestablish and to reaffirm uh, the economic health of communities that have been systematically stripped of resources for generations is going to require a lot of money. There's an enormous cost. To speak requires an enormous cost of reputation, of influence, right? To, there's a, 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 an enormous cost on, on the kind of policy governmental decisions that you want to see in the world, right? There is a cost that some of those might not happen as you empower people who think differently than you to come to sit in seats of power. There's a cost of personal well-being, right? As we are forced to reevaluate what is safe and unsafe, what is acceptable and unacceptable, there is risks, there is a different cost that is being asked of us to engage on these discussions. 
the cost of caring for others. And this, by the way, is just uh, talking about the cost of, of, of caring for those uh, in the people of color discussion. This isn't even talking about folks who, who live in, in a different socioeconomic environment. This isn't talking about folks who, the, the investment of, of putting into folks who are unchurched or dechurched and have no access to the love of Jesus. This is not talking about the cost of, of relationships in our own church, right? The cost of caring for others can be astronomical, and if we look at Peter's example, we see pretty quickly that no price is out of bounds for what Jesus could ask of us. Jesus asked Peter to face crucifixion. No one, no one would willingly walk down a road that they know leads to crucifixion unless... Unless, in the course of understanding their own forgiveness, their own debts that have been paid, their own reconciliation with God has set their hearts ablaze for seeing wrongs righted. Unless the Holy Spirit comes and sits upon us and gives us a vision for God's kingdom, then we would not take risks in any of those categories. But those who have been forgiven... Those who experience the love and the reconciliation of Jesus, those who have been given the spirit of power, have a purpose for losing their life. And that is the glory of God, the coming of God's kingdom, and the peace and shalom that will reign on the earth at the time. The cost is overwhelming. But it does not happen overnight, and it does not happen all at once. It happens as the Spirit of God leads us one step at a time. As we count the cost of what God has called us to, and we follow in faith because we are moved by thankfulness, because we are moved by the forgiveness of Jesus, we will be willing to lose even our own lives. Finally, the forgiven are the people who are willing to come in last place. Jesus, Peter, after he hears these heavy, heavy, heavy words from Jesus, he looks over his shoulder and he, he sees his buddy John behind him, right? And he turns to Jesus and says, Lord, what about this guy? What about this man? If I'm, if I'm in line for crucifixion, what does he get, right? You see, it's, uh, it's only natural, right? If you get a pay cut, you want to know, did, well, did everyone get a pay cut, right? It, it, we measure ourselves and we measure our treatment against the ever-moving target of the Smiths next door, right? We want to know, is he better than me? Is he better off than me? Am I being treated differently? The disciples we know have been at this from the very beginning, right? Remember all the arguments about who will be the greatest Jesus in the kingdom? You remember when Peter uh, throws everyone under the bus at the Lord's table and he says, Lord, everyone else might fall away, but I won't. I'll be better than them. Remember, even at the resurrection story, John relates this hilarious story of, of how he really beat Peter to the tomb. He was faster than Peter was. There's a one-upmanship. There's a comparison game that goes on, but Jesus' reply to Peter is pretty abrupt. If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. You follow me into the path that I have laid out for you. You see, Jesus is giving Peter the ultimate heart check here. The ultimate uh, understanding of, of, of what is your motive? What is your reason for doing what you are doing? Is it because you're comparing yourself to others? Or is it because you are measuring yourself against what Jesus has invited you to live? See, if you've acted under the guidance of the Holy Spirit with the motive of reconciliation, right? Then you will not have an immediate need to compare yourself to others. Even right now, some of you are sitting here, and as you hear me talk about race, you look at me and you say, you hypocrite. You hypocrite. I know who you are with. I know who your friends are. I know how little you post on social media, right? And you want to say and feel better about yourselves because you have done 
more than me. And if you hear Jesus right, I want you to understand that between you and Jesus, it matters very little that you've done more than me. The question is not if you've done more than me. Have you done what God has given you to do? Some of you are sitting with tremendous guilt of all the things that you could have done that you haven't done in life. And you think you've done a lot less than me. And yet, if we hear Jesus' words to Peter, we realize that it matters very little if you have done less to me in the past. The question is, is will you respond to the places and the times which God has entrusted to you? Can you take the first step? Can you hear out an argument that you've been otherwise unwilling to listen to? Can you consider that there might be experiences in the world which are different from yours? Can you open your heart to what God might teach you about the world? Right? That's the kind of boldness. The kind of boldness that doesn't try to to find a comparison, that doesn't try to reassure itself based upon where it stands with other people, that to give up that inquiry, to give up that comparison can only matter, can only happen if the results no matter long to you. It doesn't matter if you're the best or the worst. It doesn't matter if you're the best off or the worst off. You see, the forgiven are satisfied not by comparing themselves to other disciples or other co-laborers. The forgiven are satisfied by the assurance of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit who is working in them and through them. Ultimately, it is the forgiven who are willing to come in last place, who are willing to give up their comparisons, who are able to find peace in God's world. And so a blank sheet of paper awaits us, a blank sheet of paper uh, that we know what we are supposed to do, a sheet of paper that we have anxiety because we don't know if we can. What I want to encourage you with this morning is, is that if you go out on your own, if you go out and you decide you are going to single-handedly dismantle racism in Memphis, you will fail. If you think in your head, I will uh, systematically on my own defeat this sin pattern in my life, whatever it is, you will fail. If you decide in your mind that you will be the perfect Christian from this day forward in your life, I promise you, you will fail. But if you know that you are forgiven, if you know that you have not just been restored and and allowed back in through the back door, but you have been restored and placed, that God has entrusted to you the times and the places and especially the people that he cares so very much about. If you understand the the gratitude, then while your words that you type on the page, they may be befuddled, right? They may be confused. They may be even factually incorrect. And quite frankly, none of them may make it into the final draft. You're going to have to clear out all of those first befuddled words, right? But can we, as people who have been forgiven, As people who have received the Holy Spirit take the first step of of splattering some words on a page, then, and when we're moved out of a response of the forgiveness and love of Jesus, when we're moved by the power of the Holy Spirit, that we will be able to actually care for our fellow people without regard to to how uh, the blessings or hardships that everyone around us is experiencing. And we can care for those people even at the cost of our very own lives. Why? Not because we're strong, but because the one who has called us to care for other people is faithful, and he will do it. Pray with me. Father, we gather this morning... Lord, in our hearts, know that we have a a long way to go in every aspect of life. And the calls of of this moment are just one of them. Lord, yet, Lord, we need your grace. 
Our hearts need to be quieted by your outpouring of love for those who have failed. You, we need to be reassured of your, your extravagant care for those of us who are culpable of evils which we did not even know about. Lord, give us the freedom, the freedom that comes from your forgiveness. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.